murky but numerous records of legal proceedings between the inhabitants of Dur Medina have been preserved on papyri and bit of stone. Statement after statement, the dark side of a seemingly peaceful village gradually comes to light. The story of one unfortunate lady by the name of Heria also shows how extremely fragile the souls were handled. Looking at the little village of Dur Medina today, it breathes calm and harmony. But that was not always the case. The atmosphere there was noisy and bustling, where children's laughter could be heard between lively discussions and sounds of animals that played an equally active part in the life of a village. Not everyone got along and raised voices were not a rare occurrence. Sometimes, Disputes led individuals directly to the cannabis, the village court, where parties gave a side of story. Witness statements recorded on papyri or limestone or straka with flat surfaces reflect how busy this court of law was at all times. The crimes and offenses were as varied as the recorded statements, ranging from non payment of the sets to theft, adultery, divorce, murder, or rape. In the most simple cases, ancient justice relied on eyewitnesses who described more or less exactly what they saw, hearsay witnesses repeated what they heard, testimony from individuals who were involved and confessed under torture or to escape punishment, and material proof, which was sometimes established during the hearing itself. There was one last category of witness, those who dreamed about events and could therefore point out who was guilty. In an earlier video entitled What Does the Egyptian Book of Dreams Reveal? we saw how the meanings of dreams followed a strict code in antiquity and in ancient Egypt people saw dreams. As dreamers played a passive role instead of an active one, they could not be held responsible for what they saw in the sleep. However, dreams played a major part in hearings and, in general, witnessed testimony. They were considered messages from the other side, sent by the dead or by gods. So if testimonies were ever proven to be false, witnesses could always hide behind the fact that they were simply messengers and probably misinterpreted a message. British Museum Exhibit No. 65930, a piece of limestone ostracon, details an accusation against a woman by the name of Heria, resident of Tural Medina during the reign of Seti II in around 1200 before Christ. Year 6, third month of the Shemu season, day 10. On this day, the workman Nebnefer, son of Nahi, came to the court to accuse Heria. The workman Nebnefer said, as for me, after the war, I hid one of my chisels in my house, but it was stolen. I let everyone in the village take an off that they had nothing to do with my chisel. And after many days, Nebu and Nebehet approached me and said, A divine manifestation has occurred. I saw Heria steal your chisel. So he said, Let's take a short break here to comment on what we've just read. You will notice that Nemnefer is the one carrying out the investigation, instead of the local police, even though they did exist. He's the one questioning the villagers and made them swear that they did not steal. 
Since he did not interrogate either area or neighbor neighborhood, it can be obviously assumed by questioned only the men of a village. The stolen object in this case was a chisel, a tool that was partially made of metal, which explained why it was valuable and why Nemnifer had it in his home. Since tools traveled fast, Nebu and Nebehet learned about the theft of a chisel and reported a dream to the workman. She had indeed seen the culprit in a dream. How convenient! This is what the rest of the inscription said. The court then said to Heria, so are you a person who stole Nemnefer's chisel or not? Heria said, no, I'm not the person who stole it. Then the court said to her, are you prepared to take a great oath of a lord, life, prosperity, health, about this chisel, saying I'm not the person who stole it? And Heria said, has the moon endures, has the ruler endures, life, prosperity, health, the one whose power is greater than death, Pharaoh, life, prosperity, health, if it found that I'm the one who stole the chisel. So here it appears as if there's something missing, but there is a gap in the text since we can't see the end of the sentence. But actually, nothing is missing. The court scribe decided to stop recording Aria's testimony in mid-rant, which is quite curious and shows its absolute lack of interest in the accused and what she had to say in her defense. In fact, he started taking notes again one hour after this interruption. An hour later, the court questioned her. The servant Pached was sent together with her to a house and she returned with the chisel. It was hidden in her things together with a copper of a moon, a good encounter. She had hidden these in her house after she had stolen the copper of the of a moon. Yet she had taken a great oath of a lord, life, prosperity, health, saying, I'm not the person who stole the chisel. So the court stated, Aria is a great criminal who deserves death. The workman Nemnifer is in the right. The case was postponed until the arrival of a vizier. Aria was therefore declared guilty of stealing Nemnifer's chisel and an unidentified copper object belonging to the Temple of the Moon and sentenced to death. The crime was deemed serious enough for the vizier, the equivalent of a prime minister, to be informed and called. At the time, there were two viziers, one in the north to investigate cases in Lower Egypt and the other in Thebes in the south to direct the affairs of Upper Egypt. There are a few shady points worth noting about this case. Nebu and Nebihet came forward with her account not immediately after the theft, but several days after Nebnefer had interrogated practically the whole village. She did not provide any details at all about the theft and simply indicated that her dream identified the culprit knowing very well that her testimony would have very serious consequences. You will also notice that this indirect witness was not called to testify, but her testimony was admitted as reliable and truthful proof. The court scribe, who was supposed to be impartial and meticulously record everything that was said by witnesses and the accused, did not bother with Aria's defense. However, this trial was not the only one in which the theft of property was reported, or even the first to rely on possibly false testimony. But the death sentence was never given in cases of theft from an individual. The outcome was different, of course, for the theft of property belonging to the state or God. During the hearing, it was reported that another object stolen from the Temple of the Moon was found in Aria's house. This was the same Aria who was not at home at the time, so it was easy to frame her by planting objects in her house while she was out and during the absence of her family members who could have defended her during a trial. Since safety devices during antiquity were basic and not highly effective, it was easy to frame someone else for a crime, especially a woman.
Also we see the same Nebnefer in another case, this time accusing we, a workman, of stealing three of his chisels and arguing that two witnesses saw them at his house. Unafraid, the accused replied that we were his, which he narrated from his father and the case was closed. So either Nebnefer was really a poor guy with constant bad luck, or he was dishonest. It's likely that he had not been honest in the second case, so that raises suspicions that he probably wasn't honest in the first case either. The fact that Nebu and Nebehet magically, or rather, primly learned that area was a theft seems to show that the poor woman was the victim of a conspiracy. We will never know what happened to her, but 3,200 years later, we can at least restore her reputation.